Welcome to another edition of Songs of the Ozarks, a project of the Ozarks Studies Institute, an ongoing initiative of the Missouri State University Libraries. My name is Emily Flatness, and today's date is November 13th, 2022. Our special guest today is the Hosey Ballou family, and we are here at Nixa General Baptist Church Building. Thank you all so much for meeting with me today. Welcome. I'm so excited for our interview. First of all, if you don't mind telling me, are you Ozarks natives? Well, I certainly am. Uh, going back about eight generations in the Ozarks. Uh, so I've, my people have been here long before. Uh, as when I ran for office in Christian County, it was uh, noted that uh, we were in Christian County before Christian County was Christian County. So uh, it, it goes back a long way. My roots are deep here. Well, my roots are deep, but I was born in Wichita, Kansas. Wow. And I like Missouri really well. <laughs> and uh, we can't we can't move back here probably when I was about eight years old. And my dad and them started the ball knobbers down at Branson. And so yeah, our roots go back pretty deep here in the Ozarks. Wow, Miss Debbie, I had no idea that you yes. had that connection to Branson. We and did. She, and she. They were only in Wichita because her dad and some others from back here went out to work for Cessna Aircraft Corporation. That was 1951 when, when she was born. Uh, so that's why she was in Wichita. So they were native Ozarkians before they went out there right. to work. Wow. Well, dad was. I wasn't. I hadn't been born yet. <laughs> so I you're... was already thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> so your maiden name is Mabe. Uh -huh. Wow. Bill Mabe. Bill and Joyce from my parents. My dad passed away about 17 years ago and I miss him every day. Mm -hmm. And he would always tell us when we did well on a song and when we didn't. <laughs> wow. We'd practice for a church concert, for instance, and he'd come up the day before and we'd say, Dad, how did it sound? It's fine. <laughs> well, if it was fine, we knew we had to practice more. Passable. Right. It's passable. Just <laughs> wow. barely passable. So he had an ear for music, and Joy sang on the show for Did several you years. Really? Nineteen years, right? Or is it eighteen? Long? Eighteen years. Yes. Wow! So and you're Branson uh, royalty. <laughs> no. <we're And> <laughs> and she was she was sixteen and singing on the show when it was still in on the lakefront in the renovated yes. skating rink. And I got a job. I was finished my sophomore year at SMS, and I got a job as the parking lot attendant and the custodian. So that's when I fell in love with her and married her when she was still 17, and we just passed the 53 years of marriage. Oh, together. congratulations. And of course, Joy is a lifelong uh, lady of the hills. <laughs> a lady of the hills. Oh, lady of the hills. It's going to be my new thing I refer to myself as. Lady of the lady hills. Lady of the hills. Nice. Like that. Nice. I yeah. was born in St. Louis, Missouri. But my family moved around quite a bit, and I came here, graduated in Springfield, and called this home. I've traveled a little bit since then, but it seems this is my magnetic center, so I always come back here. Mm. So Jeff, how did you two meet? Church. Actually, I, I attended, and I was, their, I was their sound technician for years before, uh, before Joy and I ever, ever dated or anything else, and, uh, and she finally, I wore down, so... Perseverance, <laughs> you just gotta wear them down. Yes. And we've been nice. uh, we've been married 25 years. Oh, congratulations. We've had to get him used to our country song. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's got a Since beautiful Since he's from the voice. big city. He's, <laughs> right, he's big definitely city. not a hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> like the rest of us. And your wife he's is hillbilly, hillbilly royalty. I know. <laughs> what am I, uh, Lady of the Hills? Lady, Lady of the, of the Hills. Hills. Lady of the yeah. Hills. I'll do something. That's so nice. <laughs> That's the new password on your email. But Jeff, um, you, had the, you had the promise in Branson that you yes. managed that show. Right. Whenever Ooh. Joy and I, when Joy and I uh, married, I came off the road and uh, and went to Branson, and so we did a few shows in Branson. The Promise, Lost in the Fifties, Open oh, awesome. Music City Center, and then uh, came up. We did Remingtons for eleven years, and then Joy and I have been at the historic Gilloway's Theater in beautiful downtown Springfield for. <laughs> Eight years now. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so, tell me a little bit about 
your roots here in the Ozarks um, and your roots as musicians. And also, um, tell me a little bit about if your ancestors um, were pastors or reverends or do you have any um, hereditary connections through that? My great grandfather was born in 1945 or 46. There's mm -hmm. some dispute on that. But his name 19? was 18. 1845 or 46. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> his, uh, his name was the same as mine. My first name's William, so uh, he was William Hosey Blue also. And uh, he fought in the Civil War for the North and uh, um, was a believer. I know very little about his practice of the faith, but he was a believer. Mm -hmm. uh, then my grandfather, well, my mother and father, Hosey and Thelma Blue, uh, my dad came from a family of eight boys and one girl, uh, and his mom and dad, and he was the first person uh, that was converted in that family, and he was an adult. And after he became a Christian, over time, all of that family became Christian. My mother was from a small family of just uh, her mom and dad and three girls, and they, she was the first to be converted in her family, and after that, they all became Christians as well. My mm -hmm. father was a lay preacher. He never felt that God called him to be ordained. He thought his spiritual gift was encouragement or exhortation, he would call it. And he would help small churches that were between pastors, sometimes for as long as a year or two, uh, and, uh, and be their preacher. But he never, felt, uh, he never felt called to be ordained. Their roots were very, very deep in the church. That, that was life for them, in a sense. Uh, we, in my family, mom and dad had nine children. I'm the baby of the, of the nine. The first two died uh, before either one of them reached three years of age. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there were seven of us growing up in a house uh, in Southern Christian County. And uh, my dad played a Gibson guitar. My mother played an accordion. And uh, we would uh, sing. That's wow. what we did. We, we would sing. And church was the best day of the week because... Uh, and because we got to sing. And so when I was even, I've, I'm one of those rare people, I'm 74 and I've never been out of church. Uh, not because I've not been as carnal as sin at times, but I've never been out of church. I love mm -hmm. the church, but when I even, when I was little, they let me sing. That was, that's what they let me do. And, uh, and so I, I've always been a part of the church. Started leading a choir and uh, working in a church setting when I was 17 and did that for 10 years, was a high school math teacher for seven years, and then I tell people God didn't call me to preach, he nagged me to preach. I had a thought <laughs> that I couldn't get rid of, and right. so the day came that Debbie and I and three little ones, Joy would have still been, uh, uh, Joy would have still been six years old, Robin was uh, three years old, and Will was a baby, and we went to North Kansas City to seminary during that time when I made that transition. Mm -hmm. So uh, musically, uh, I would just simply refer to it as hill country uh, gospel music. Heavenly Highways hymnal was what we used at the little church that I grew up in. And uh, so there's a strong country music influence in that, but our mm -hmm. family was focused more on the religious music, although I still remember my dad singing some of the songs like In the Misty Moonlight, a love song, and di different songs that uh, Do What You Do Do Well was another one that he uh, would sing around the house just uh, so he was a, he was an oral storyteller mm -hmm. and my mother was a writer. She left us with uh, about three self-published books of, of her life and one of them, uh, going back a bunch of years ago now, they interviewed her from uh, Ozark Watch, Ozark Watch, Ozark oh, Watch I think was that, and they planned on doing an article on her, and instead they did the entire thing, the whole thing was on the life reminiscences of Thelma Jean Keithley Ballou, wow. and so we've got those treasures in our family. Um, remind me where you said you grew up mm -hmm. and where you graduated high school. Okay, so if you were on Highway 65 going toward Branson, okay, you get 14 miles north of Branson, and there is a crossroad there, uh, and to the left is Highway A, to the right is BB. If you turn left on A, the state road goes for about a half a mile, and then it drops off into what's called down there Dry Holler. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we lived on that road. We had 120 acres of mostly cedar trees, but uh, we had 120 acres that connected with Bull Creek. So we were raised on, on the creek, and that's got a pretty strong uh, tie to our whole family. Even though they weren't raised there, we still, that's where our roots are. I went to uh, elementary school at Highlandville, uh, which was part of the Spokane school system, and then I went to high school at Spokane High School, and then to SMS uh, for my college uh, work, and then, then to Midwestern. Yeah. Alumni. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I didn't realize that you lived so close to Branson too. So mm -hmm. you guys are right next to each other. And not only that, but he, his family. His brothers and sisters, of course, they were all older than him. They were the waymakers that sang in that area for so long. And it was a double mixed quartet. Four, uh, four high school age guys and four high school age uh, ladies. And most, half of those were my siblings. And they sang with, who was it? The country song, rock singer? Uh, that did, uh, that helped uh, with with, with the uh, boys, camp boys the ranch. What's his ranch. name? You would have to ask me. Stan but Hitchcock. Stan Hitchcock. Stan Hitchcock. Oh, yeah, wow. country singer. Yeah, and uh, so they 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 did Not some singing with him. Did an album with him. Where one side of it they backed him up, and the other one was the Waymakers. So, wow. so. You know, I think I might have an old record that you love Waymakers. Maybe it's possible. Maybe. It's possible. Um, so did you all have a theater down there? No. In fact, you said we were close to Branson. It, it seems strange to say it, but Branson wasn't in my world when I was growing up. Wow. Uh, first place, we didn't go hardly anywhere, but when we did, we tended to go towards Springfield or, oh. or those kind of things. So uh, Branson was just not in my not radar. Not until he now, really came down to be at the ball. Not oh, yeah. <laughs> now, there wasn't anything there yet. In nine, it wasn't until 59 the first show. Yeah, wasn't so to go, yeah. You would go to Forsyth now, before you would go to Branson. Well, at Rockaway Beach. Yeah. Right. Rockaway Beach was the place. I just met a lady yesterday that even the 1950s, she got to go on her senior trip to Rockaway Beach. Because uh -huh. that was before <laughs> wow. they built the dam, and so the water was, it was a warm water lake. And it, I, I was there when it was wall-to-wall -wall people. There was some near, if not riots, that took place during there. And, uh, of course, Debbie. It was a wild to... place, and my daddy wouldn't let me go there. <laughs> oh, no kidding. <laughs> Thank the Lord. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about your upbringing then, Debbie, and your connections to music. And well, I can remember my dad being on the road a lot. Wow. He, he worked really hard. He worked at Hagman's to, uh, through the day, and then at night he played music. I can remember going to fox hunts, and we'd sit around the fire, and dad and his brothers would sing. I can remember when they played as the band for the dance down at Shepherd of the Hills. And I can remember when they played music and even did some of the shooting things that they did at Silver Dollar City, you know, the acts that they did. I can remember all of that. I, my one major memory that haunted me for years is when we were go to Shepherd of the Hills, they would say, now watch out for the panther. If you hear that panther, and I'm a little girl, <laughs> and I'm thinking, there's really a panther down here? Aww. And we would, that was before they had the trams to ride, and we had to walk. And every night, I'm scared to death Aww. walking. And nobody ever told me there wasn't a panther oh, down man. there, no, you no, know. There wasn't a panther. <laughs> Poor mama. But my, uh, I did have uh, whom we called my dad's dad. We called him Papa. And he w became a Christian late in life. And he became a pastor. And they always said that he learned to read by uh, the Bible. His wife taught him to read by reading the Bible. Um, so he didn't have a lot of education. But he loved, he did love God, and he mm -hmm. loved the Word. And out of that family, there was, what, 13, I think 11 that lived. The uh, brothers and sisters. Oh, wow. And they all sang. They could all sing or play an instrument. So we just grew up. But one, one memory that I love is my daddy would never, never be gone on Sundays because he would get home maybe two or three, four o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. from a road show. 
and uh, he would lead the music at church and he would take us to church. Church was very important. Mm -hmm. And he would try to do Bible time with us through the week, you know, before we'd go to bed and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, <laughs> like, a, like a kid, who, who wants this? But it was ingrained in me to where I could, as I grew up then and became a mother, a wife and a mother, I could, could not go to bed before I read God's word or had my prayer time, mm -hmm. you know, because of those things that were so important to my family. Certainly. Mm -hmm. And then as our children were born, Joy's our firstborn, and then Robin came three years later, Will three years later, uh, and... Uh, but and then we adopted a little boy three years adopted, after mm -hmm. that. Uh, John three years later. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but anyway, as, the, as they came along, they God gifted them with the ability right. to sing. Mm -hmm. And you'll appreciate this, I think, that with Joy, probably four years of age, maybe began to sing a natural harmony with us. And the thing that always would always amaze me, we could we could be doing a song. We always sang in the car. We could do being, be doing a song with no instrumentation, no, no music playing, we're just singing. And if, that's, if she was singing the harmony part that has to move because it's a minor chord, she would instinctively know to move to that, to that sound. Wow. It was just something in her. And, uh, and so then when Robin came along, she was our high, she's our high singer. And <laughs> our she soprano. sings at Ridgecrest all of the time. She's very, very Robin involved does. there. And Joy and Jeff, I'm thankful, are, help us here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we'd do without our family. Mm -hmm. Our son, Will, has the, a beautiful country voice. Wow. And we have grandchildren that can just sing up a storm. Wow. And it's just something that is in us. Even when Jose was a teacher at Nixa, I school math teacher, he was also pep club sponsor. <laughs> so he drove the bus. And we would have Joy with us on the bus with all of the young ladies. Joy would stand up on the bus seat. That's for seat belts, you know. And we were allowed to do that back then. Yes. And they would want her to sing. And we just, we would sing. And, of course, the main songs that we sang were religious songs. Mm -hmm. Now, she did sing Delta Dawn oh. when she was five years old down on the, at the ball office. Wow. You know. And turned around and looked at the guitar player when he missed a lick. Yes, so. and the and the guitar I've never player. I've heard that before. Oh, he Seriously. always said, you, "Really? Yes." Yes. yes. He not said, "You look at him." Surprising. I'm and so he, sorry. he thought to himself, <laughs> "She actually knows I missed that." Right. <laughs> well, you're the ball mobber princess. <laughs> Lady of the hills. Lady yep. of the hills. <laughs> but I can remember with the ball mobbers that they were they had their first show over the uh, police station. <laughs> Really? And if they didn't have 50 people, they'd give them their money back. Oh, wow. And because they were really the first show down there. Yes. They certainly. weren't the first out on 76, maybe, but they were the first show down there. And uh, we would just sit there and wait and count the people and see <laughs> whether they had a show Did you or not. Nights hope that they didn't get yes, to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to go home. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, what was it like? growing up playing music with your family? You know, Dad talks about us singing in the car, and that was so, we now say later, they, they did that so that we wouldn't fight in the car. You know, <laughs> and people would say, when do you practice? Well, we didn't practice. We just sang in the car right. all the time. But you all and enjoyed so, it, too. Oh, and singing. we loved it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we loved to do. And so we would sing, and... We sang all types of music. Yes, we My did. parents also loved 60s, 50s, oh, you know. The real it's sad it's songs, songs teeny, too. Weeny, yellow polka dot bikini, <laughs> you know. We loved any song that made us cry. We made Dad, oh, always wanted him to sing those sad Marty songs. Robbins tear jerkers, oh, you know. Sadly. Any song that made us cry. And then Robin and I would go. Blind purple people eater, don't forget yes. that. <laughs> but then Robin and I would go during recess at school, and we'd get on the merry-go-round, and all the kids would come around us, and we'd sing all those sad songs to those kids <laughs> in elementary. And all those kids would be crying. I'm thinking, there are probably some parents not very happy. <laughs> you know, but we thought it was awesome. We were like, yeah. But, you know, we loved to sing, and we just always, 
I think because we did it so much and when we'd go down to dad's mom and dad's, um, there was no TV. They didn't have TV. And so um, there were always guitars. And I always say, you know, I learned to love the Eagles and oh, Alabama yeah. and those groups. They had such tight harmony and all. I was the first girl. There were like how many boys? 12, 12, 12 boys. boys cousins before me. Then wow. I was the first girl born to the Blue Clan, and they took very good care of. <laughs> they did, but they but I heard all their music. They were enough older than me, you Big know. Smith, but I, yes. you know Big Smith. I that's do. our cousins. Some some of them. Well, some. Of them. I mean, they're all my cousins, but I have many more besides. Yes, them, right. is what I'm saying. And so they all they there just was always music, and so that love was just always there for it. All kinds of music. Mm -hmm. yeah. We grew up with music. Period. And they always knew. Now, I was a Glen Campbell fan. Oh, oh, me too, Debbie. And they always knew when they walked in the door what kind of mood I was in. Really? Yes, by what I played on and the she record. Played such and I knew as well, because if I came in and Glenn was singing The Dreams of an Everyday Housewife, oh, I knew that it was not going to be a good time. <laughs> And it, it or Freddie Fenders, Freddie Fenders before Freddie the next Fender. teardrop falls. Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> then it was like, Mom's in a blue moon today. Well, she she broke up with me four times, and of course that was because I started dating her when she was 16, and she was uh, not ready for that kind of commitment. But, <laughs> I kept but thinking I need to date more guys. One of the times she broke up You're with nice. me, she broke up with me, by, she broke up with me by singing, Please Release Me, Let Me Go. <laughs> So it's See, like, I always thought that was a joke, but that's true. It's true. It's true. true. Okay, good to know. He <laughs> says he didn't sing something back to me. Oh, he always sang, It hurts to be in love. <laughs> when the only one, one you love, love turns out to be someone who's not in love, love with you. you. Yeah. Well, that's but a sad story. I, I was 16. But it worked out. Right. So I was 16. Out. Uh, and <laughs> I would break up with him because I knew somebody was going to ask me to go out. And then I would realize I don't really want to go out with that guy. Oh, right. So I never went out with any of them. No kidding. But and it's been 53 years. Yes. And besides that, he had a college ring that he never gave a girl. Now I did, and so that night down at Branson, <laughs> that, down at Branson, <laughs> after we'd sung or I'd sung or whatever, I had heard that he'd never given his ring to any girl. And my old boyfriend, before I dated Hosey, my old boyfriend came down with a new truck and I took a ride in it. Oh, no. And when I came back, he <laughs> asked me if I'd go steady with him, so he gave me his ring. <laughs> so you've always been manipulative. <laughs> <laughs> but once I got his engagement ring, that was it. I, I didn't That's look at anybody no. else. Aww. Well, so. you had a lot of guys looking at you as Branson royalty. Oh, my yes. goodness. Oh, my goodness. And Jeff has been such a blessing. He has got the smoothest voice. He's my yes. favorite singer. Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, he really does <laughs> have true. a smooth voice. And he's come in and sang with us he's when got... Southern Gospel was not <laughs> his genre, so to speak. So what is your genre, Jeff? Your preferred genre? I don't really have. I don't really have a preferred genre. I mean, I grew up. I grew, I'm the youngest of five sons. Uh, all of them are far more musically gifted than I am. Uh, they all play instruments and sing as well. I didn't know that. But um, but I never I never was gifted in those areas particularly. I tease them all the time and say I've had to work very hard at the things that they come nat that comes naturally to them. And so uh, while I've made made a career in entertainment, the reality is I, you know, the language I use is basically I'm in the 63rd percentile, which means that I'm a, an above average vocalist and I acknowledge that. He's but, better than that. But, He's but in the 60, I'm good enough to be above average, but not good enough to get paid on a regular <laughs> basis. And so, uh, so we move, so we move through, but it's, but it's been great. But I grew up on, I grew up on, uh, on larger theater, you know, stage. So mm -hmm. coming out of St. Louis, going to the Fox to see things like The King and I and Camelot and mm -hmm. Brigadoon and those types of shows. So I, I, I'm, I'm a crooner fan. I love, you know, I love Sammy Davis and mm -hmm. the early Andy Williams stuff was the stuff my mom would listen to. And, 
and those types of things. But I, I crossed the gamut. He introduced uh, me to the Rat Pack. I didn't know who the Rat, pack, know who the rat was. pack was. And, Coming uh, from those Arkells, I was like, right. Rat pack. Well, you're the... Lady of the Hills. The right. Lady of the Hills. Right. That's right. But I, but I love. I mean, I, I love Southern gospel. I, my father would listen to Hobie Lister and the Statesman Quartet. I remember him having some of that, and I heard early Oak Ridge Boy stuff mm-hmm. when they were still gospel before they had crossed over into the country, country realm, and uh, and so I was familiar with that. And then I had not been to Branson either until I started dating Joy, and I wanted to go down and see what she did and. And it was pretty fascinating. I really think it's probably uh, not respected nearly as much as it ought to be. The same way I don't think Southern Gospel is probably respected as it ought to be. There's a work ethic that's involved with a lot of the groups like the Hoppers and, and several of those that work very, very hard on a regular basis um, and are out working the road really, really heavily and uh, don't receive the kind of recognition they probably should. Certainly. When did you all quit singing in Branson at the Bald Knobber Theater? I quit the night I got married. <laughs> the night you got married? Yes. Did because you sing the night you got married or the night before? Night before. Uh, because in that day and age, in the 60s, it was just pretty well known that if a lady was, young lady was to get married, she didn't work. Oh, right. But that's not my memory, but that's, you know, this is where you're, you're different. What's There's, your memory? My memory was we got married a year before we really planned on it because mm-hmm. I got to where I couldn't live without her. And uh, so um, so I had one year of college left, and um, we, uh, we talked about it, and we agreed that our schedule would not permit us to both me to go to school and me to work and, and her to work. and Did, did you work? I did. What did you do? I worked on campus, as you recall, doing uh, custodial <laughs> work. I had forgotten that. And I worked every summer uh, at a station and grocery store, and I drove a, a truck yes, delivering baby, water to did. people. Yes, baby, you worked and, hard. Uh, <laughs> you know. Anyway, and, and she worked at the credit. But the point was, we had come to an agreement and I really did think it was an agreement that once we got married, the schedule would not permit her to be down there on a, on a nightly basis. And that that worked well until Monday night after we got married on Saturday. And on Monday night, it was show night, and they were letting us stay in the little building, a right little, next a little to house the by that. Show. And when the music started and you could hear the bass uh, coming through the walls of that, uh, she was like a racehorse that has just heard the bell, <laughs> and she wanted to go, and I, I did. I said, he really I said, got mad. No, I didn't get mad. I just said no. Because, oh, oh my! But, you got mad. I'm, I might have gotten mad. I don't yeah. know. But it was my because I knew, that, I knew that, that. I knew that if she per, if she went back that night, then that, that would become the pattern. But if I could do it all over again, go back to the end, I'd say, sure, go ahead and sing. You know, I really would, but. I, you learn along the way. And then I might not have married you. Might not have, yeah. Usually, it, it's kind of known that if he tells me I can't do something, that's when I do it. <laughs> so you've sat that's down That's when you, you play s- Dreams of the Everyday Housewives. Right. <laughs> so you sat down there, How? what were the years? I just really, two years. 1968, 1969. Wow. Uh-huh. Until August the 30th of 1969, that was her. Uh, that was when we got married. So, so I so started much. when I was 19, um, 1989. To um, and I remember distinctly having a conversation with you because you have such a tender heart. And I remember you saying to me, you would have done it differently. Mm-hmm. If And so he really encouraged me mm-hmm. to take the job. And mm-hmm. to, he said, if you have any hint that this is something you would want to do you need to do it you need to try it you know and he really encouraged me in that and i love that um of course my grandfather was my boss right um, so, which is not always easy at uh, times i adored adore that man um but it was he actually didn't want to hire me because wow. i was going to School. at the time sms wow. and i was a music education major and I guess it was my third semester of college um, that I got the chance to go work at the ball numbers. Well, Grandpa, did he wanted me to finish school. And one of my other uncles, Lyle, Mabe, uh, actually pushed 
pretty hard for them to hire me and so mm -hmm. they did and I'm grateful mm -hmm. um, and it and it was a you know I wouldn't trade it for anything I worked there 89 to 99 mm -hmm. then I actually left for six years, six years I believe. and then I went back I was the only one to leave and come back oh, I nice. hold that distinction yeah um, so when I came back in 2006 six thanks dad because I can't remember that. I think I was there eight years then after that. Wow. So yeah, eight, a to total of 18 years that I worked That's down there. That's a long there. time. And my brother sang and played on the show. So, so I sang, I sang with my uncle cousins. every night. Yeah. We sang these big duets, you know, and all the crowd would think that we were so in love. And it used, I was so tickled about it all the time. <laughs> we, get, we would always go out and talk to the people that came on the buses, you know. And so they would always ask, you know, oh, you know, are you guys married? And Aww. and I would say, I would say, actually, um, I'm he's my uncle, and he used to change my diapers. And he'd be like, don't tell him that. And I'm like, I think it's funny. Oh my goodness. Um. So how did Jeff you move from having your shows in Branson to being such a big part of the Galois? Oh. Well, prior to Branson, I actually came out of, uh, I, you know, I mentioned I was in that 63rd percentile, right? So I started in production and uh, in, in regional Christian music, contemporary Christian music in the, in the mid 80s, early 80s. And that was really exploding, sound scan and other things that were happening. And so uh, I got into concert production. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I had been married previously. And whenever that, whenever that marriage ended, I relocated to Nashville and mm -hmm. uh, had the privilege to to work with Christian artists like Michael W. Smith, DC Talk, some of these guys, and toured with them, moved into uh, working with a record company and got into promotion. And so over the course of it, I've lived long enough uh, to be able to get paid in virtually every segment of the industry. And, uh, and so I went back to, I went to The Promise for many of the reasons that he was talking about with the work schedule. I was, I had come back to Springfield uh, and had been on the road. And when she uh, finally relented and said that she could see a future, but that she wasn't <laughs> going to leave the Ozarks. I mean, she made that mm -hmm. really, really clear. I was actually in Los Angeles on our telephone call with her. And, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, and she said, uh, she said, I... She said, when are you coming home? And I said, well, I don't know. I actually have some great work happening here. And she said, oh. And, uh, and being the intuitive male that I am, I heard <laughs> oh. And I said, what does oh mean? Does that mean that you would, you would pursue uh, going out with me if I was there? And she said, yes. And it was about 9 o'clock L.A. time, 11 o'clock her time. She'd been at the show that night. And, uh, and so by 11 o'clock the next morning, I was on an airplane out of LAX and back at her house the next night wow. in the driveway when she got home. And I said, you said you would go out with me again if I was here, oh, so I'm here. You and, dropped uh, everything? I dropped everything what and left Sean Fairburn man. high and dry in Los Angeles. And, uh, well, I and, love you even more. Uh, uh, that's good, because Sean Fairburn, my partner, doesn't. And, uh, <laughs> And so, uh, so it was great, and we uh, and we and and we went from there. So, I went to Branson because I wanted to be on the same schedule as she was on as much as I possibly could. And so mm -hmm. I went, and originally as an actor, and was not very good. And, uh, not true. and then you were they great. and then they found out that I had marketing experience, and so they said, "We need you upstairs." And that was really whenever I developed the love for the administrative side mm -hmm. of it. And so I did a few of those shows. I uh, got to work with a director named Mike Meese, who is still uh, one of the most brilliant influences of my life. And, uh, and we did several things, including in Mackinac Island and, and a couple of other things. He's been great. And, um, and then we went to Remington's. You know, and, uh, and do you know what Remington's is? I don't think I do. So Remington's was Missouri's largest nightclub. It's on West Republic Road, and it actually was built by Mark Mohan from Mohan Construction out of Kansas. But that uh, that venue had eight lawsuits and seven years of operations. Oh, it was not well well run, and um, and so uh, it's close proximity to Ridgecrest where Hosey was. Mm -hmm. uh, Hosey could probably speak to it more, but he would call them. They would let us use the parking lot for parking, which was not a small thing at the time. Parking was a significant challenge for Ridgecrest at that time. And so 
But a uh, bar doesn't need any Sunday morning parking. That's right. They were right. closed. And so they had this enormous parking lot, seven acres of parking that was open and in close proximity. So every quarter that they let us use that, it would come up on Hosey's schedule to call Mr. Mohan and thank him. Mm -hmm. And he would typically, as I understand it, conclude the conversation with, if you ever choose to sell that property, let us know. And after the eighth lawsuit, Mr. Mohan said, I am actually going to sell that. So mm -hmm. the church purchased it and really in a novel novel time because the Baptist church agreed on anything. That's pretty novel. Uh, but they, <laughs> they agreed to buy a bar, uh, which is really novel. And then it was even crazier because uh, the idea was, what if we bought this building and we gave it back to the community? And it became a community bridge facility that allowed us to reach tens of thousands of people and raise millions of dollars for the local library district and other nonprofits. And we were able to be there at a really critical point whenever Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast and, and operated with 13 different government agencies to uh, facilitate assistance for displaced residents. So it was a pretty remarkable time and I was there for 11 years. Hosey brought me in out of Branson and, uh, and put me So there. I was still working in Branson at night and I was his free labor during the day. <laughs> there was nothing free about that labor. There was nothing free about that labor. But, uh, but we were there for I 11 years. And about, yeah, that's right, and about uh, eight years in, eight and a half years in, the Gilloys called and asked if I would consider coming down to work mm -hmm. on that. Uh, the board president had known me uh, even from my Nashville days, and, and I said, no, frankly, we had just gotten Remington's paid off, and, and we had just gotten released from that financial overhead, so I thought, why in the world would I want to go somewhere else right now whenever we're just getting to the place where we're loosed? from any financial challenges that were there as a nonprofit. So I said no, and Joy again was still working. Uh, and then when they called back in 2014 and said, literally, we need an old guy. Uh, <laughs> that was the opening line from the president. And I said, well, I'll call my therapist and then I'll call you back because I didn't realize <laughs> when I became an old guy. But things had changed. Joy had retired by then. That was, uh, that was September of 2014. She had retired in January of 14 and was still deciding what she wanted to do. And so we agreed that if we went down together and could work together, that we would, uh, we would take that on. And uh, the board was gracious in accepting that offer and getting creative about it. And so Joy made a really remarkable trans, uh, transition from, from stage to front of house, which is not easy to do. But mm -hmm. as associate director, she is absolutely doing remarkably well in that transition. It's not, it's not comfortable or fun for many performers to, mm -hmm. to leave the stage and make that move. And from time to time, I'll still say, are you sure that you don't miss it? And she, so far, has always uh, either lied to me or been convincing <laughs> that, that she, she's happy with the transition. So, that's, so that's, where, that's where we went, and we've been there ever since. And it's been great. I mean, it's really been a good They work together well, and we get to go down and volunteer. Oh, they do wonderful. Go volunteer. Yes. And did you well, want a I snippet was, or two of the song? That's what I was going to say. I'd love it if you guys could sing a little bit. <laughs> So, um, the only other thing that I think may be really, um, maybe important is what changes have you seen in, you know, the Branson world, um, and this Springfield Green County area in entertainment? Well, let me address that question, but from a different, little different angle, if that's Certainly. okay. Uh, and just, I want to talk a little bit about the change in the the religious expression uh, of our culture now, as opposed to when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And I say that because um, 60, 70 years ago, uh, I was in a, raised in a little General Baptist Church, same denomination, headquartered out of Poplar Bluff. Wonderful people then, wonderful people now. But they were amazingly expressive people in their worship. Worship was, was, uh, was strongly participatory. Uh, it was, you learned to sing loud and high. That was the way you did that. But uh, testimony meetings, it. when they prayed, they all prayed out loud at the same time. That was the culture of that. Uh, there were people who shouted in religious ecstasy during the service. Um, and so it was very expressive. That has changed dramatically in my mm -hmm. lifetime. Doesn't mean that people are not wonderful, but 
I think we have trained, without intending to do so through the years, I think we've trained people to be more passive in mm -hmm. worship. Their task is to come in, listen to whoever the people are on the platform, yes, maybe sing, uh, but, but become less, uh, pro, uh, less active in a personal way in that. Um, and I, I regret that. Mm -hmm. Now, I think th that there are exceptions to that by far. There's, pl there's churches that are tremendous. And there, was, there were years at Ridgecrest uh, that uh, I would have I said and still would say that no church sung, sung congregational music as well as our church did. In fact, when we designed our second worship center and we brought in a consultant from San, St. Louis uh, that would design the, the building for sound purposes. And they began to talk about platform things. And I said, you, you need to understand where I'm coming from. I want you to be thinking about right out here in the middle where people are going to sit. I want, the, I, want the, I want their music, their sound, to be wonderful. And they created a wonderful uh, place. And during the years that we were there, and we were in that uh, building, I guess, for uh, nine years, and the congregational worship was, to me, was wonderful. It was mm -hmm. nearing heaven. But as a whole, the culture of religious expression in our area, even among the Pentecostals, even among the Assembly of God, again, that's not a blanket statement, but in general, there's, there is less expressiveness in the church. And I think, I think that's uh, not a good direction to go. I think we need to get the attention off of the platform personality uh, mm -hmm. more into the people in the pews. So that's been a change in that. So that wasn't your question, but that's that my answer. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. You're and welcome. I really cannot state much about the uh, Branson area mm -hmm. because after my family got out of it, my dad and my son and my brother passed away, and we all just got kind of got out of the ball knobbers. My mother, Hosey, was her proxy for a year after my dad died mm -hmm. so that she wouldn't make a fast decision. But then whenever we decided it was better to change it and to sell it, we got out of it. And I've really not been in the, been to many of the shows, you know, or anything like that. So I really can't say we, what's going on. We still love Branson. You know, we love to go to Branson. Mm -hmm. I, I never understood. We always lived in Nixa, typically, and drove, so I would drive to Branson every night. Right. And people were like, you drove all the way to Branson. <laughs> I'm like, it's the most beautiful drive that to me. Love, yes. The most beautiful drive. And and it was my favorite thing to do. Probably the, the if I ever miss anything from down there, it's the people who mm -hmm. I adore. I still have lots of friends yeah. down there in shows. <laughs> Very talented musicians. Um, but I miss that drive, you know. And I just, I think there's there's a... You talk about roots. There's something about the Ozarks yeah. that's inside of me, deep in me. Yes. Jeff and I went and did a renovation on a theater in Wichita Falls, Texas. And Dad would call him about close to the two-week mark and say, are you bringing my daughter home? Oh. But Jeff would also know I couldn't, I couldn't be gone from here for a full two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's like there was something in me dying mm -hmm. because I wasn't here, you know? And people in Texas would say, well, we have trees and we have hills. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> we have trees and we have hills in the Ozarks, but that's not what you have. <laughs> and I will take that back. We went not too long ago to see the 60s oh, show yeah. and we loved it. Mm -hmm. we loved it. And there's Very... a blue, there's a blue in that one too, Mike Williams. Yes. So yes. we got lots of family. And I still, still I want working. to go see Clay Cooper. I hear he does a great job. Yeah. Yes. So I've that, that that's too. one I plan Grand to go countries, see. Great Grand shows. countries. I think after my dad family. and brother passed away, that yeah. just I kind of lost my joy of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, down there. Certainly. I think um, from an entertainment standpoint, whenever I referenced the lack of respect earlier, it really goes to that era, right? The, the era from before Joy got there, but even the period that Joy, Joy was there, what, one of the things that made that show unique, uh, particularly with Bill and those original Maid brothers, 
is there was a pacing that was unique that's become world famous for, for Branson style entertainment. They're talking about the Balnaber show model, the way that the, the speed of the the speed of not only the music but the transitions, the, the amount of time that it took between the breaks. Comedy served a function. It wasn't just there for right. for uh, for the grins of it. It was there to serve a purpose. And uh, and as a result, that's why the Balnabers are in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. for their contribution to American culture and, and what happens with it. But, but the other unique thing about it was, for me, coming out of the Nashville scene, was the reality that they were playing six nights a week with no sampling, no technical, no pitch correction. It's actual musicians singing and playing 100% live night after night after night. And coming from a 60-city tour, which at that time was a top five Rolling Stone tour, we were doing five shows a week, uh, and it was exhausting. And we had, we had technical equipment that would allow for, for that. Now you're moving around, so obviously it's harder on your voice if you go to Colorado and you have been in a bus for seven hours. <laughs> you know, it affects your range, it does. And so building those safety tracks to be able to hit high notes those are, those are essential and, and happen in the touring now with the pace that they have. But for Branson to sit down and do what they were doing, which I would say if you're asking about the change, I would be more critical, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And I would say that there's not the level of musicianship today that there was mm -hmm. at that time, uh, with very few exceptions, Grand Country being one of those exceptions. Uh, but for the most part, there's a lot of tracking, not a big fan, mm -hmm. uh, and there's not the level of musicianship that was there at that time. And uh, the other interesting thing about Branson specifically is because the shows were never the number one reason that people went to Branson. People went to Branson for the outdoor activities. Mm -hmm. That's always been the case, even at the height uh, during the bus industry in the 80s. But Mike Woody at Soda Dollar City was a strong analyst who made it really, really clear as people were, were being, uh, were being uh, sampled throughout, throughout that transition. They were trying to track they were trying to track things really well. And the truth was, most people were coming for the outdoors and they would see a show mm -hmm. while they were there. But the lake, the lake was still always the star. And that's part of the reason the Bald Numbers never did matinees. I sat with Bill Mave repeatedly and mm -hmm. would say, why are you not doing matinee shows? And he said, why would I compete with the lake? Mm -hmm. When they come in off the lake, then they'll go to the show. And so there was, a, there was a wisdom and a purity to his plan that he maintained throughout. One of them was never doing Sunday shows for him. And one of them was never playing matinees. He didn't want to work. Uh, he didn't want to work that hard. He always said to me, "1,500 people a night's enough." <laughs> and uh, and most shows down there would say to this day, to have 1,500 people in a day would be amazing, even if it was Certainly. over three or four shows. So so it was a unique deal. So I would say the transition would be the level of the level of musicianship that was there was truly. Uh, it was a magnet that brought the, the national acts like Roy Clark and the, and the Andy Williams and the Tony Orlandos and those guys to come because they recognized a work ethic and a level of musicianship that said we can, we can go shoulder to shoulder with them and feel good about our association. And, uh, and I think that's different than it is today. It's still a great destination, but... Uh, it is, but they don't make they don't make shows like they don't make shows like that anymore. And the fall time, we went on a um, sabbatical when we were at Ridgecrest, at Navarre Beach, Florida. Loved it. It was what six weeks, five weeks. Five weeks. Wow. So. I could not wait to get back oh. to <laughs> Missouri, and we drove, and we we pulled into Kentucky and stayed at a little cabin in the woods. And I heard the sweet birds singing, and and rather than the seagulls and things like that. And <laughs> there's just something about this area that is beautiful with all the different birds and and the trees. God's nature is beautiful. It is, and it's Ozark's mm -hmm. nature is exceptionally yes. beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just take a drive and look at the trees in the in the sunlight, and you think, wow. All right, ladies, I have, have good you news got... to bring. I can Jeff no. sing bass on no, that one? No, you're good, you're good. Yeah. I'm gonna you get sing one bass with you're, next, you're all right. The next I have good news to bring, and that is why I sing all my joy with you, I'll share. Well, I'm going to take a trip on a good old gospel ship and go sailing through the air. I'm going to take a trip on the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Well, I'm going to shout and sing until the heavens ring when I'm bidding this world goodbye. I guess you're going to.
whole stuff right there. The whole this whole show is not religious, but it's just Ozark music based, right? It's whatever you. It can be whatever. I was gonna you say have mom do a little bit just because I love. It was my favorite song that, I, of course, I wasn't there when she sang on the stage, <laughs> um, obviously, but uh, but it was one of the first songs I remember learning. Oh. Um, the Reno. Mm, across the West right Texas key. border. That's too low, isn't it? Okay. Across. Okay. Across. <laughs> across the wild Texas border was no law and order when Reno brought me to this land. It was after the wild ones and Mustangs the shy ones and hoping that I'll understand. But there's too many long nights A wife should have some rights It seems that it's so plain to see Read all my loved one Oh, he loves the wild ones Much more than he'll ever love me He's riding somewhere out there With his raven black hair And a heart that's loving and wild Songs I, I'm sure I was three or four when I started singing that with him. I thought she was gonna say, uh, I want to tell you all the story about she a did, she Valley. Did. She did an incredible yeah. version of Harper Valley. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff, Jordan, Jeff, do just a little bit of There's a River with me. Okay. There. and a course of one that I wrote that the Ball Numbers Quartet recorded and uh, I calculated one time that over a two or three year time period there was probably about 300,000 people heard it. They had a video that played behind it and it went like this. Oh, billows roll and threaten to or flow me I have a cat Not long after the um, 
oh, the airplanes that 9-11. 9-11. They were in the studio with Rodney Dillard recording that song, and uh, they came to, uh, first of all, they basically had trouble singing because their emotions were so high. And I, one of the things I love about the, the song, though, on, the, on, the, on there is they were working on the bridge. That was the ball uh, numbers. The ball numbers quartet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were working on the, uh, uh, on the instrumental bridge there, and Rodney picked up the guitar and played it. So the bridge you hear on that's Rodney Dillard playing it. Oh. So that's always cool. You can hear the CD, but yes, yeah. it was. Yeah, they called it. It was good stuff. But we probably, as a family, done how many recording projects? Ten? We didn't even talk about well, that. Well, no. There, so over the over the period that Hosey was at Ridgecrest, right, they always did an annual concert on the third Sunday in August that was a gift back to the congregation <laughs> because that was the uh, anniversary of whenever they were called to serve there. And so, uh, so they would record each year. And in the old, old days, we would record onto a cassette tape straight off of an auxiliary send on the board so it was just that day what and then for the 20th what, what we get was a shotgun mix <laughs> in, in every in every way uh but then for the 20th anniversary we decided to go in ahead of time and make a studio recording and that became the tradition for the next 10 years but we also did uh we did another project called heavenly highways mm -hmm. hymns that was uh, that was based on that hymnal that, that Hosey referenced earlier that was such a strong influence on his early days. The old and song and just the keyboard, right? And the, yeah, just the but piano. Most of, most of those albums we did with the incredible Lou Whitney. Lou Whitney at the studio. Who is an icon in Ozark's in music. Yes, uh, yes. On South Street at the studio. Which yeah. is no longer there. Which is no longer, I got, to no longer there. I got to do a project with Big Smith that we call Little Hosey because that's what I was called when I was a boy. Oh. A little Hosey and Big Smith, and it was 12 gospel songs that I had written, and they did the instrumentation oh. and the background vocals and for it. And so our daughter Robin did that as well. Robin, yeah, she had written Robin. several songs, and Big Smith backed her up. And, and it was all done in blues. And all done in blues. Yeah. 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 yeah, he mm. produced that record with, mm -hmm. with Lou, and it's called Rick. Release Me. And, uh, and it, it was a it was it was good. So yeah, there's like 13 studio projects between between them all uh, that that happened. Wow. Majority of them with Lou. There were a couple of other excursions, but for the most part with Lou. <coughs> all right, I'm fading. <laughs> <laughs> He's preached twice today. Oh, so. Well, right. I can't even thank you guys. We and, are delighted. Uh, it it was wonderful. I can't even tell you. Well, this has been another edition of Songs of the Ozarks. Thank you all so much for meeting with me today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. You're welcome.